Here we are again this morning with time running out rapidly uh, in our third part to the message entitled The Porter, the Portal, and the Path to Pasture. We will look this morning at uh, Romans. John chapter 10, once again this morning as we began this message with this scripture and we'll look at it again this morning. John chapter 10. The Bible says, Jesus speaking here, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way the same as a thief and a robber. Let me say in that one verse right there again, as we did in session one, that that speaks of grace and law right there. Because only the one that came with grace and truth, to offer grace and truth, he's the only one that came through the door. Every other person has climbed over. That's law. Law makes you climb over. Because law won't let you go through the door. You understand that? Jesus fulfilled the law. That's what opened the door. That and the shedding of his blood for all of us. You need to know that today. The law makes you climb and work for what you get. Grace is what Jesus brought to the world to lead his own out by the grace he tasted death for us through. Amen. Amen. It's the grace of God that he tasted death by that allowed him to come into the flock of the world because God sent his son to save the world. Yes, he sent him for Israel first, but there are many Old Testament scriptures concerning you and I as Gentiles, just the heathen out there, the the lost uh, uh, ethnic groups. All the other people outside of Israel are called Gentiles, and it was always God's will to save all of humanity. But God knew that most of humanity would reject him and not want anything to do with him and that even most of the ones that claim to will never come onto the narrow road to accept him. Even even many, uh, most of those who think they have a relationship with God are those who don't know God at all. Because Jesus said there will be very few that will find this way. It's a narrow way. I believe the narrowness of the way is what makes it, makes it bright as it is. I do. Think about that. If this room was totally blacked out and I had a needle point of light and it came on, every person in here would find it immediately. You would see it. It would get your attention. And the narrowness of this road, the preaching of the cross, gets everybody's attention. That's why there's such a hatred toward true Christianity because there is a true power there working. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16 tells us that, that as we carry the knowledge of our triumphant Christ everywhere we go, the aroma of his knowledge, that we are in some the stench of death And we are in others the very aroma of life unto life. But it's the knowledge of his triumph that he leads us in, the scriptures there speak of. Not just the word Jesus or the knowledge of of, of some Jesus, but the knowledge of the Jesus that gives the triumph over sin. That means faith in what he did at Calvary, amen? So, In the very first verse, you'll notice grace and law because anybody trying to climb up and work for salvation is under law. Anybody that's under grace simply had been saved by grace and now they're following Jesus by grace, the same grace they received when they were born again. Jesus says, but he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the porter opens. The doorkeeper opens. Now think about that. The por- what made the door, and we'll talk about it again this morning, what made the door open for Jesus to allow the shepherd to go in? The law. 
being fulfilled. And I brought out, I believe it was last Sunday maybe, that the law is God himself. Because God's law is God's word. And God's word is God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. John 1, 1 and 2. God's word is God. And when God gave the law, that was God giving himself to a degree to his people so they could have a little more clarity about who he is and what he expects. But it couldn't save them. It couldn't open the door. Nobody could get into heaven. Even the saints of the old covenant could only go to paradise because the shepherd had not entered in to the fold yet. It took someone to keep the law completely, a sinless man, and then to lay his life down for the sheep. And when he did that, that, the renting of the veil from top to bottom was a sign that was signifying now the door is open for the shepherd to come in and get all those who are his. All those who are his. Are you thankful this morning that you're a sheep in his pasture? That he came in and he called you by name and he saved you? It's more than a church thing. It's more than any religion. Lo, it's the, it's the man Jesus Christ sent by his father, commanded to come, and out of love came and laid his life down so he could come and get you and bring you out of sin and its bondages and all its fears and shame and everything that, that sin has brought with it, you can walk free of today. If you'll stand in that liberty wherewith he made you free and came in and got you by grace, led you out by grace, and will lead you to evergreen pasture by grace, beside ever still stream of water by grace, but it's only by grace. That means it's only him who can do it. And it means it takes your faith for him to do it. You see, there's something about liberty and freedom that's a little different. They do mean the same thing. I've been liberated. I'm free now. But there is a little different twist on those words. If you're in a prison cell and I come walking by and you've been locked up for years and I say, hey, I've got the key. And I stick the key in and unlock the door and open the door and I tell you, you have the liberty now to be free. But you've got to believe it and get up and walk out. You've got to believe it. You've got to get up and walk out. You can sit there in that jail cell as long as you want to. You have the liberty in Christ to be free. Amen. You have the liberty in Christ to be led by him as your good chief and good shepherd every day. But you also have the choice that you don't have to be led by him. And there are many sheep who go astray and they get out there and they, bah, bah. and that's all they're doing. And they still, they still say all the right words, but they've gone, they've strayed. We've all strayed. But they stray. They still talk the right words. They still say the right thing. They still think they're okay. Sheep that go astray think they're okay until the bad comes to get them. And let me tell you something, every sheep that goes astray, the bad wolf is going to get them. I'm not talking about straying from a local church. You hear me this morning? I'm talking about straying from the leading of the shepherd. And most Christians think they are being led by the shepherd, but they're not. You can't be being led by the shepherd and not be being changed by the shepherd. You can't be being led by the shepherd and stay in the same cycle you've been in 
with the same issues you've been in, with the same bondages you've been in, year after year after year, saying all the right religious things, but no change is taking place. He came and got, he came in to get you out. Hallelujah. The Bible says he was born of a woman under law to redeem them that were under the law. He came, uh, was born of a woman under law and lived a sinless life and bare a spotless sacrificial offering for you to get you out so that you could follow him. He, listen, he went to Egypt and got Israel out to, to bring them unto him. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says, not just so he could get them out and say, well, I got you out. No, he says, I brought you unto myself on eagle's wings. Hallelujah. And the reason he came and got us out of the world is so that we could be delivered from the world, crucified unto the world, and it unto us, and we follow our shepherd and be becoming like our shepherd. And it is a radical change. The kingdom of God is not in word, it's in power. It's not in your lip flapping about what God's doing. It's about fruit being seen by others about what God's doing in your life. It ain't about how much you go to church and you better be here every time the doors are open, but that's not what it's really about. It's about your heart. But the fleshly will run with that statement and say, well, okay, God knows my heart. I, I don't have to study. Go to God knows my heart. Yeah, he knows your heart. And if your life is not bearing out the fruit, he knows your heart is rebellious. They're rebellious sheep, wayward sheep. They're sheep that leave the flock that never come home. And most of those are sheep that leave and think they know better. Why would you leave? The only reason a sheep would leave the flock, and I mean stop following the shepherd, is because they think there's a better way. I'm tired of what he keeps feeding me. The pasture looks greener over there. But you've got to stop and ask yourself, why would you look to something and, hear, and, and see something other and think it's better that he really doesn't know properly. Why would you look away and stray? There's only one reason. Because we hear another voice. We're led by voices. Thoughts are not just thoughts, my friends. Thoughts are voices in your head. You can become angry, and it's in that anger that those voices get real loud. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You get your feelings hurt. Boy, the voices get real loud then. Oh, he hurt my feelings. Oh, he didn't let me do this. He didn't let me do that. Now the voices get loud. Now let me tell you something this morning. Folk need to find a church where the message of the cross is being proclaimed. Because it's the only message that allows us, when we hear it and believe it, to follow the shepherd. Amen. Ain't nobody following the shepherd on the planet whose faith is not in the sacrifice. Amen. Oh, they think they are. But Paul said it. There's other Jesuses. That means there's other shepherds. See, other Jesuses are other shepherds. But Jesus says some profound things here. Let's read them. Verse 2, But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and what does he do? Leads them out. Jesus came and got us and led us out. He led you out. You, you need to highlight that in your Bible. He didn't open the gate and say you're free to go because you didn't know what to do even when he showed up. He led you out. You got to follow him to get out of what you're in now. You got to follow him on into greater things for you. 
because he's the one who's going to lead you into the things that's concerning his will for your life. Verse 4, and when he put forth his own sheep, he goes before them. There, there, he's leading. He's leading. He's not following you. He's not going to follow you. If your faith is right, his goodness and mercy will follow you. But he's not going to follow you. You're going to follow him or you're not. And when he put forth, puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now, this is concrete. This is, this is, these scriptures, they, they, they make you cringe sometimes. When, well, then what happened to me, Lord? Why, you know, uh, if, I, if your sheep don't hear other voices, how did I get carried away? Because we, we can stray. We can stray. We've all strayed. We started, we, we listened to voices at times. Uh, those voices uh, were, were the climbers. You know. That's how Jude writes about those that creep in among us. How do they do it? They climb the wall. They creep. They don't walk in the, through the door and everybody sees them. Creepers climb over the wall to infil, infiltrate the church. And the church is so full today and every, almost every pulpit, seminary, every minute, almost all, everything is almost so full of nothing more than creepers now, nothing more than spots and blemishes, not just in a church here and there, but Jude says these are spots in your feast of love. Let me tell you something. Whole denominations now are one big spot where people aren't creeping in among them. The whole ministry is a creeping ministry. Well, how can you determine who they are? Jude writes about it. I hope you're listening to our Friday morning teaching and learning. You know, that's why it was written for us so you could be aware and not be led off by another shepherd. So you can make sure you're following the Jesus of the Bible, the shepherd. The Bible says they're ungodly. They turn God's grace into something it's not. The grace revolution. <laughs> Creepers. Joseph Prince. All that whole horde of ministers. Creepers. Spots. Spot. They say some of the same things we do. They have to to be able to creep in among us. But they don't mean what we mean. Other shepherds, other messages, other spirits. Verse 5, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now, these, these are the sheep of God's pasture who are following the shepherd. You see, you're not following people, you're following the shepherd. And that's why the apostle Paul could say, follow me as I follow Christ, the shepherd. And I'll tell you again this morning, the time we're living in, deception is just like, it's off the charts. The people of God now, are to, the church is to a place where they can amen and hallelujah a preacher and walk out and say, that's the best message I've ever heard in all my 75 years and it won't even be a message God will have put his approval on. Because we're blind as a church. We're deceived. If we don't get our way about something. We will stir things up. And see, that's what happens when the shepherd's leading the sheep. If you stop watching the shepherd, if you stop looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, if you stop looking unto Jesus, the one who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, if you take your eyes off of his leading, you're going to begin to start messing with the sheep in a way you shouldn't be. You see, sheep every once in a while start butting heads like goats. Sheep every once in a while start wanting to walk over in that path you're walking in. And sheep start quarreling. Sheep start what I call lip flapping. 
they ain't watching the shepherd and following the shepherd while that's going on. They're starting to do things, starting to say things, starting to uh, grab people and, uh, you know, pull people aside and start saying something to them. Listen, that's hurting the church. That's hurting the church. And it happens in, even in our, our cross-preaching churches. And they're not, I'm not, when I say following the shepherd, I'm not talking about following me. You hear me? I'm talking about following Jesus. But I better be preaching a message that allows you to place your faith in the one who can lead you. Because we're not in control of anything except what we put our faith in. You understand that? You're not in control of nothing. You might think you're in control of a lot of things, but you're not. You're in control of one thing in your life, and that's what you put your faith in. You put your faith in Christ and what he did for you at Calvary. The Holy Spirit then takes charge. He begins to lead you. He begins to strengthen you and give you the direction you need. If you don't put your faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary, then the world, the flesh, and the devil are the ones leading you. You're only in control of what you place your faith in, not the consequences that take place. Amen? Amen. I can't use God's word to try to control things. I've known women mainly, some men, that try to use God's word to control things. You're not called to be in control of anything except that which you place your faith in. We won't control. Bless God, you're a little too close to my path over here. You, you, you try, are you trying to take over my path? <laughs> we want to be in control. You're not made to be in control. And people who try to use God's word to control situations are under the law. I've known, and I said women because I've known two or three women throughout the years, wives of men who have tried to control them with the word. You're not called to control your husband. You're not even called to conform your husband or your wife, whatever, the, or your kids. You, listen. You, if you're trying to use God's word to control something, you're out of order. The Holy Spirit's the only one who takes control when he finds a faith that's in Jesus and what he did at Calvary. I've known, listen, I've known folk come home and everything be packed up and gone. Man, just be sick of religion. Or the woman, just come home. Just uh, They've packed up uh, they, years of nothing but cramming the word down their throat. This religious spirit using God's word to try to control somebody. And that's what most preachers are doing. Some have opted out of being the under shepherds God wanted them to be because they won't preach the only message that allows the Holy Spirit to take control. Because, and they will tell you because we'll lose control of the people if we preach that message. I'm not in control of you. You're not in control of me. God Almighty is in control of all things. When we try to take that job of control, we're out of order and we're messing everything up. I can't cram the word down my wife's throat and make her live for God. She can't do it for me. You can't do it for anybody. That's the legalistic law and death of the letter. If they're not getting it, just pray for them and give it to them when you can. Have an opportunity and pray for the opportunities, but you can't force feed them. Grace is never forced. It flows only when it finds gray faith in the cross of Christ. You're not in control. If she just ain't getting it, pray for her. If he's just not getting it, pray for him. But don't let, they're not, Getting it pull you out because they're not getting it will, uh, is going to cause, cause voices to speak to you. 
I remember a few years ago when uh, one of the best friends I had in ministry just all of a sudden uh, uprooted and took off to the uh, Grace Revolution stuff. Well, man, that just broke my heart. That just tore me up. And instantly voices began to speak. Well, maybe he ain't wrong. But the Holy Spirit's always going to show you the Word of God. See, that's how he leads us. If you got some imagination going where Jesus is just doing this, you got the wrong picture. He leads you, he comforts you, he strengthens you, he does whatever you will allow him to do in your life, through your life, for your life, for your family, for you. He only does it through your faith in what he's speaking to you. You only follow him as he is speaking to you. You follow him by faith, and faith comes by hearing the word of God. You have to keep hearing the word of God. The just shall live. That means daily, step by step, living by faith. And faith comes by hearing. When we start hearing another voice that also uses the word of God, that's what's so deceptive. These other voices are not going to show up and not use the word of God. The Satan in his, his utmost thrust to, to get Jesus himself, he used the word of God. He has to. They have to use the word because the word of God is God and God is powerful. Amen. They have to use the word. But these other voices will never point you to Calvary. These other voices will always make excuses of why you don't have to be obedient to God's word. Why you don't have to you don't have to be obedient to the word. They're trying to put you under the law. Boy, y'all better wake up. Hope none of y'all think that. When I tell you you got to love each other, that's coming out of the Bible. When I tell you that Paul uh, wrote to the church and said, quit your stealing, quit your lying, that, that ain't trying to put folk under the law. That's trying to get them to realize what they have in Christ and to avoid the bondages that will come if we don't quit lying and stealing. But you got them folk out there today who are hearing other voices of other shepherds. That's not the voice of the shepherd. Oh, you ain't got to go to church. You ain't got to give tithes and offerings. You ain't got, man, you ain't got to do nothing. You in Christ, you complete. You're complete in him. Doesn't the Bible say that in Colossians 2.10? You're complete in him. And if I'm complete, that means I'm not lacking. So that means it's already a done deal. That means and we say all these things and we, we, we listen to that voice and that voice leads us right astray. Because all those excuses are backed up behind some fleshly lust. Amen, Brother Curtis. Verse 5, a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spoke Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. So he said unto them again, verily, verily, I say to you, here comes the first declaration, I am the door of the sheep all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not hear them sheep didn't hear him oh there was a whole lot of speaking a whole lot of hearing but the sheep didn't hear him you say well, what about us I used to listen to voices that weren't the shepherd yeah but you know what Jesus came after you and when he came after you, hear me this morning, hear me this morning. When he came after you with the, with, with the message that allowed him initially to come in and call you out, when he came after you with this message again, you allowed him to lead you back to the flock. Amen. That's why we have a church here today because we'd all gone astray. We'd all listen to the voices but we're not out there listening to them no more. We're not, we don't follow those other voices. 
We were young. We didn't know any better. Paul said it like this. God's been merciful to, to me because my unbelief was done in ignorance. There was some stuff we didn't know. But now God reached out there with that stuff we didn't know and he's revealed that which we now know. And with that truth, he's brought us back to the flock. Then he says it again in verse 9. Again, he says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be. There it is. See, there's the word salvation. By me, if any man enter in, he's speaking of Calvary because there's no salvation outside of what he did at Calvary. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Amen. In and out and find pasture. You know, back in the old shepherding days, well, I guess they still do overseas. I, I was in Saudi Arabia in 1991 for about three uh, months and over there, they built these beautiful high-rise apartments for, to get these nomads out of the desert. And after they built them, they said, we don't want all that. We've been out in the desert for 2,000, 3,000 years. We ain't going to no air-conditioned, nice apartment. And they didn't. They wouldn't come live in them. Of course, people like us were went, dumb. But it ain't dumb. It's not dumb. That's just them and how they live out in the desert with their sheep. Amen. If they, if they send me over there, I want to go to the high rise. <laughs> Not to look like I'm important because I don't like the desert. It's hot. Anybody ever been over there that part of the world? Well, maybe I'll sign a few of y'all up to go so you can come back and testify. <laughs> now, I'm not sending nobody over there. But they, back in the shepherding days, they, the shepherd would go in in the mornings and he'd get his flock and he'd lead them out and he'd take them out there to green pasture. He'd lead them over there beside those still waters and they could drink and they could be restful. They could be peaceful. They, as long as they were with that, that shepherd, they didn't have, you listen, they didn't have anything to worry about. If you're following the shepherd, you have no worries. You have no fears. He is going to provide everything you need every day of your life. And, and, and at night, he would bring his flock back and put them in the pen there, and then he would, himself would lay down there at the door. He would become literally the block where they couldn't come back out. To go in and out, you got to go through him. He's the shepherd of the sheep. And the Lord always desires and attempts to lead us to new green pastures. You, you listen, you ain't seen no sheep just eating one pasture, and that's the only pasture they've ever eaten right there. No, that grass is gone from yesterday. The Lord's trying to lead you to new green pastures. You hear me? God's always got fresh green pastures for you that he makes you to lie down and rest. You can rest in it. You don't have to go to work and be worried about all these things. Listen, all this political stuff going on, yeah, it's definitely something to be praying about. It's definitely something to be praying about and making sure you got enough sense to, uh, to, to know who to vote for. And if you're following the shepherd of the Bible, that's a no-brainer anymore. That's a no-brainer anymore. Amen. But to be distracted and become fearful and worryful about all that, the worst thing we think that could happen to us would be that, that we die. Isn't it? The worst thing could happen to me today in my mind is if I died. But that really ain't the worst thing that could happen to me today. In all reality, that might be something horrible for my family, but it'd be the best thing for me because I'd be with the one who bought me, who came to get me. You know, there's just too much, there's just too much friction and envy and strife in the body. There's just too much. 
you know, there's, I mean, as long as we've been listening to this message, and it's not that we don't do dumb stuff, because as I told you Wednesday night, sheep are dumb. Now, I ain't calling you dumb, but sheep are dumb. Look it up. Sheep are dumb, and we're sheep. Put it together, and you don't have to get past kindergarten. You've got to have a shepherd, and you ain't it. You've got to have a shepherd. Jesus came to become your shepherd, good shepherd, great shepherd, chief shepherd. All three of those titles are given to him in the word of God. We brought it out Wednesday night. He is the good, great, and the chief shepherd. He's the only one that can lead you beside the still waters. He's the only one that can lead you and make you lay down in green pastures. He's the only one that can lead you into the places that you need to be, where you need to go. You can't lead yourself. If you try, you're not going to make it. We need to know that. I want to read a couple things to you. Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 through 22, a certain scribe came and said unto Jesus, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. That's what we said when we come out of that gate that first time, wasn't it? Ooh, I'm following you every day, Lord. This good. I'll follow you wherever you go, uh, Master. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That means Jesus, his head, his authority. That means Jesus is looking for a place to lay his authority, to offer his authority, to offer his shepherding, which is only in the heart of men who trust in him through faith in what he did at Calvary to become the shepherd. And verse 21 says, And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Let me say this this morning. Our mission is to follow him at all times. And when Jesus walked in the earth, says, Follow me, that means now, not next week. Now faith is. Faith ain't coming. Now faith is. You either, you either believe in or you're not. If you wait until next week to believe, you're in big trouble. Number one, next week may not come. And number two, you believe in something you shouldn't be believing, saying, I'm going to wait to believe anyway. But this man said, okay, 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 let me go bury my father first. Jesus said, just follow me. Let, let the dead bury the dead. Are you all right? What's that mean? I shouldn't take care of my family's funeral? Why, well, it's just that old fleshly thoughts, isn't it? Bless God. No, that means he's got to be first. Not in some lip flapping way every day. Lord, you're still first. Oh, God, you're still first. No, the fruit of our life shows he's first. Faithful to the word of God shows he's first. Faithful in the community. Faithful on my job. Faithful to raise my kids. Faithful to my wife. Faith, faithful shows he's first. Amen. Amen. The church, the message of the cross is slowing the testimony down that says, I know I should have, but I didn't. I know I shouldn't have, but I did. I used to. We used to. It's, it's shutting that all down now for a remnant. Now we're finding ourselves with the power of God to be obedient because the Holy Spirit now is, we're being taught how it is. He works according to this legal work that's been provided. I can't help that what we hadn't known in years past, we do know it now. You hear me? We do know it now. This what we boast in being determined to know nothing other than our fruit better be according to that. Amen. Because if that's all I know and all I'm trusting in, then I manifest here 
with the expression of Christ. Am I perfect? No, but I'm not making excuses as to why I'm not walking by faith in the Word. Why I can't gather with the saints on Sunday. Why I can't give and be a part of the work. Why I can't pray. Why I can't witness on my job. Those days are over and out the window. Because now I know I'm being led by the shepherd. I know that I'm following him because I now have the fruit of Christ. His fruit. Amen. Amen. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. This is the very next verse after Jesus said, Follow me and let the dead bury the dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered in the waves with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him. And notice verse 23 he said, His disciples followed him. So a whole lot of folk hanging out at the church that are not disciples. whole lot of folk. Disciples follow Christ. He is the shepherd. And his disciples came to him and awoke him and said, Lord, save us, we're perishing. In verse 26, he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? We'll stop right there today and say this, that if you'll follow Jesus, there's going to be storms, but he will stop every one of them. Yeah. But you've got to follow him. A lot of Christians get caught up in nothing but one storm after the next. Most of them are self-inflicted. Envy and strife among the flock. Envy and strife. Do you know, <clears throat> if I can keep talking here, let's look at James 3.16 and I'll close out today with this. <clears throat> For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil world. Where there's envy and strife among the flock, that means somebody is no longer following the shepherd. What does envy and strife bring every, every single time? Confusion. And what does confusion open the door to? It's right there. How much evil work? Every evil work. Do you see how much you need to avoid any envy and strife? For confusion exists because of envy and strife. And when envy and strife is taking place among the flock or even among the employees on the job, there's going to be confusion. And envy and strife is always the manifestation of confusion because if I weren't confused about who my shepherd is, I wouldn't be envied. I wouldn't be in envy and strife. You understand? When I get caught up in envy and strife, I've become confused about what my shepherd can and cannot do for me. And when I hear the message of truth, the voice of truth speaking to me, and I reject it, and I don't repent from the envy and strife, I'm caught up in every evil work. And five years down the road, locked up in the penitentiary, I'm asking God, how did I get here? And it all boils back to one thing. I stopped believing that Christ and what he did at Calvary was enough. That's, it. That's, it. That's always what's on trial. It's never the people you're bickering with that is a distraction, that is something the flesh and the enemy team up with to confuse us, to allow a greater effectual door for the enemy, every evil work to come in and take you out. But as long as you're following the shepherd, see, here's, here, comes, here comes the problem. They won't go with me. You keep following. Let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead congregate. You follow the master. 
If she wants a divorce, he wants a divorce because you're following the master, then it looks like the divorce is inevitable outside of their salvation. You understand what I'm telling you this morning? Because what's on trial is your faith, the trial of your faith. Will you follow the master no matter what they do? I've got to follow Jesus no matter what they do. If they tell me today, my son and my wife, I'm done with all this cross stuff, I'm sick of it, that would tear, that would tear me up probably worse than anything I've ever been torn up over. But I would have to go through that. And I would have to keep following the master knowing that the master wants me to follow him no matter what I lose. Because he, my losing stuff is not his focus. Boy, it get quiet in here on that? Well, bless God. He wants me to lose stuff? No, he wants you to gain him. No matter what else you lose, he wants to gain all. He's not going to. But he'll gain a few more if you keep following him. Even if you lost a son, daughter, husband, wife, father, mother, whoever, whatever it, it seems like you've lost, the master is leading you to a greater place of victory. And we have to follow him in spite of every other voice we hear. Now, you don't hear messages like this when you're struggling, typically. You hear messages like this because there is an onslaught of attack plans waiting for you in the days ahead. Some of you may be going through stuff right now, but these messages are also to put you on guard for days ahead. When I make you mad and you don't get something you wanted and you don't get to do something you thought you needed to do or I didn't do something you thought I should have done and you, now you're mad at me and, 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 and now, now that's envy and strife begins to set in. Amen, Brother Curtis. Listen, some preachers are expecting these massive ministries. That ain't what the Bible says is going to happen in the last days. I'm not shocked when people forsake the assembling together of themselves. I'm not shocked by that because that's prophetically going to happen. I just don't want that to be my number. I don't want to be at home and be a media member unfaithful as ever. When I've got a place God planted me to be able to flourish in the courts of my God. Because, see, the, the church is about loving and growing together. Amen. Family. We're all one bread. I read it this morning. We are many, but we're one bread. One bread, one loaf. Amen. Amen. Follow the master. Yes. When you're not getting to do what you think you should be doing, follow the master. When other people won't go with you, let the dead bury the dead. Let them have the congregation of the dead. You keep following the master. And don't just get deceived in, 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 in some deceitful way. Think that you are following the master when there's no fruit of the master. The fruit is obedience to the word. Amen, Amen Brother Curtis. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Days ahead are going to be tough, folks. This message didn't come into the church just to, just to, oh man, just to cushion everything. This message has been brought into the church to fully arm you for the days ahead. The onslaught that's coming against the church is something you today cannot imagine. Thirty years ago, the people then couldn't imagine the way things are today. And if the Lord tarries ten more years, we can't imagine the horrendous unbelief and, and falling away that's going to take place. But there still will be a people that don't love their lives more than they love the master. You've got to love the truth. And his name is Jesus. 
And if you love that truth, that one who is truth, he will change you and lead you through, through every valley, a shadow of death. He will remind you he's with you. You won't have to fear any evil. He will lead you through every situation. And when you come out, you won't be all mopey and, and falling further away from the flock. You will be stronger than ever before. Amen. Amen. Most Christians grow, go through horrible things, and at first, boy, we're going to make it through this. Bless God. We're going to stand. But then about six months come, and where are they? They're gone. Because it ain't about that first stance you take. It's about are you still standing in the end? And if you're following the good, the great, and the chief shepherd, you'll be standing You'll be standing as a chaste virgin one day before the Lord, trusting in that one who came in to get you, called you by name and led you out and led you all the way home. Hallelujah. Stand with me this morning. Praise the God.